like, you should get up really early because that's the nicest part of the day. And then you just go to bed kind of early because it's really hot. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this isn't how we do it when I come from. <laughs> An afternoon nap? It's like, what are you? I never. Why won't that cock stop crowing? And they're like, it's a bird. It's what it does. Chill out. That, that moss was fucking huge. And she's like, just throw it over the balcony. It's fine. Hello, everybody. How are you? Lillian? I'm doing... <laughs> Should we just pause and let the audience respond? Creek, creek, yeah, you creek, guys, creek. <laughs> quickly, out loud, don't care if you're in public. How are you? Oh, we're so glad to hear that. Unless you feel oh. bad, then we hope your day gets better. And we hope we can help turn it around, don't we, Piper? Yes, we sure do. Um, who knows if that will be uh, true on this week's episode or not, because we are talking about a book that I feel like 50% of Jane Eyre fans don't like. Yeah, it's it really it is one of those things that I find so funny, because when I talk to people who like read books regularly and are like into literature and stuff, and I mention Jane Eyre, I've had this book mentioned to me more than anything else, like more than adaptions, more than any of other things. But also when we're in the Jane Eyre fandom Mm -hmm. and we talk about Jane Eyre, this book is also brought up not in a positive way. (laughs) I think it's kind of down the middle. I feel like people are either kind of, yes, like how you set it up to say from a literary perspective, it's like this beautiful piece of of fiction and it adds like an incredible commentary about how modern audiences sort of think about this world. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also, yes, I feel like I've come across quite a few, I would dare to say, Rochester stands who do not like the way this book portrays him. <laughs> so, Which, fair. Yeah, because he, he's but, not great but what, it. It, <laughs> what did we read that doesn't portray Rochester well, Piper? Well, it's a novel called uh, Wide Sargasso Sea, and it's written by Jean Rise. So we decided, because we've talked nonstop about how important Bertha is, and boy, do we wish we knew more. And so Jean took it upon herself to write Bertha's story, uh, or as in this case, Antoinetta's story. Uh, yes. So uh, real quick, just because this book is too elaborate to try and do our usual recap. The gist of it is, is that you get uh, sort of three chunks of this story. The beginning part sort of talks about Antoinetta's childhood growing up, um, her relationship with her mother, some of the hardships that she faced. We then jump to her marriage to uh, Edward Ro- Edward Fairfax Rochester and mm-hmm. the uh, troubles that they go through. And then we jump to her being at Thornfield. And um, I think it comes in right after she has attacked her brother, Richard Dick Mason. Mason. Uh, and then... <laughs> Which, Jesus Christ, Dick. Yeah, come on, dude. What the hell? Uh, and then we get up right until she burns the house down and says her final farewell. So that's sort of what uh, Jean has kind of this is how she's told Antoinetta's story, a.k.a. Bertha. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it is, it made me feel a lot of feelings. For sure. One of the biggest immediate feelings that I had about this story was it was sort of the opposite of the books I usually read. Mm-hmm. In that usually I read romances where I know all the characters are going to be happy by the end. So I'm like, it's going to be okay. It doesn't matter that these sweet little beans are in trouble right now because it's going to be fine. And instead it's like, let's watch the mental deterioration of a young woman Mm -hmm. as she goes through hardship after hardship until she finally launches herself off of a flaming building. Yes, it's this is a very (laughs) sad book, you guys. Um, If you have not read this yet and you're feeling a little blue and sad things make you sadder, then maybe don't check out this one. Wait until you're a bit in a better place. Um, But if you love sad stuff, then absolutely read this book because it's going to tickle that sad scratch for you. I really, I feel like if I had thought about it a little bit harder, which I think Piper and I can both agree, I should not think about our schedule as hard as I do. (laughs) If I had thought about it a little bit harder, I probably wouldn't have scheduled it during the winter sads. Yes. Because, (laughs) oh no, oh no. Very sad book. It, 
Okay, so my first note here is that just with how beautifully it's written, because b- despite being sad, this is like this woman's mm-hmm. writing style is is very poetic. Um, so with how beautifully it's written, and then with also how sad of a story that it is, and also with its, its historic context um, and setting, I really this reminded me so much of Beloved by Toni Morrison. Oh my God! Yes. Yes. Which is a book that Lillian and I read in high school as part of our IB literature cl- uh, class. So that the whole time I was reading this, I'm like, this is like I'm back in my IB class. And we're reading sad fiction, and then we're talking about it, being like, yeah. oh, I think this is the symbolism of how uh, whites in America are the worst, <laughs> and and it really sucks to be a black person, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just Piper and IB lit was just like, I'm sorry. Did I know? No. Was I part of it? No. Am I more sorry now since this has happened? Yes. Do the systems that were created at the time still exist in a way that we're still benefiting from and it's oppressing you? Yes, and I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a whole lot. It's also like those kind of stories are some of my earliest introductions to like seeing characters with true genuine suffering and also people mm-hmm. who are dealing with like mental illnesses. And it's so interesting to see that portrayed because I'm like you seeking out romance and happy stories i'm yeah. someone that's kind of what i want to spend my my free time on so then i read these and I'm like, oh boy this is so sad and i'm sorry that people out there have hard times <laughs> well and i think that similarly the part of the reason why i reacted so big to you doing the comparison to beloved is similarly to beloved because i don't want to just be like guys this is so sad the reason it's so sad the same reason that beloved is so sad is because it's so good yeah. It does such a good job of like putting you in the place of this incredibly complex situation Mm -hmm. where it feels really real in the head of someone having a mental breakdown and what the situation is that's kind of putting them in this position in the first place and all of the factors that lead up to that. And you have sympathy and rage for every character in this book. Absolutely. Uh, One note that you just kind of touched on there talking about like that it's the history of it. There's so many weird, are you seeing these hairs? What was that? It's like a piece of dust. (laughs) I I want you guys to know that from my perspective, we're keeping this in the podcast, from my perspective, fully a giant white like snake or bug just like came down at Piper it turns out it was one of her hairs falling on the camera. It wasn't, I don't, it's probably my hair. I think it's a cat hair. There's just a lot of dust okay. flying around right now. So. so it was either you or Minnow just pranked me. Oh my God. That was scary. I saw that. I'm like, ah, what's happening? <laughs> um, but no, so the um, uh, talking about like the, the historical kind of context, just real quick. I don't know mm-hmm. if you did um, any research. I assume that I've you got did. Some- I've got some dates, but okay. let's go historical context. So because when Bertha's childhood is kind of happening in the 1830s, mm-hmm. like in and around uh, Jamaica. Uh, so I know about some of these conflicts, but I looked this one up specifically. So there is a part in this story in the beginning of her childhood where a bunch of people come and burn down her family's estate. And she and her mother and her like half brother and then a bunch of the servants and her new stepfather, they all have to flee the house as it's burning down. And it's this very traumatic event. Uh, so this, I feel like the author, I assume, took somewhat inspiration from a lot of the intense um, things that were happening around the time in Jamaica. The most notable is the uh, Baptist War, also known as the Sam Sharp Rebellion, also known as the Christmas Rebellion. Uh, and then it has a bunch of other names. But um, in 1831, and then even into 1832, because this was an 11 day rebellion that started on December 25th, uh, and it involved up to 60,000 of the 300,000 uh, slaves in the colony of Jamaica. This uprising was led by a Black Baptist deacon, Samuel Sharp, and waged largely by his followers. The revolt, though militarily unsuccessful, played a major part in the abolition of slavery throughout the British Empire. So that was a big thing that happened in real life uh, in Jamaica in the 30s, and this kind of event that happens in Antoinetta's life, I believe is like kind of a nod to that sort of uh, conflict that's happening. And did you have a date specifically for that? Of the uprising? Yeah. Um, Yes. I'm just curious. Yeah. So it started on December 25th, 1831. uh, And it was a, it went on for 11 days. Okay. 
Because, so just to add the kind of bigger points, which bizarrely, I didn't even think about this when we were reading, when we were watching Belle and I did my little quick slavery facts on for Belle, uh, which I know everybody's like, you know, I want to listen to all the Jane Eyre Air Buds episodes. I should go listen to Belle. It'll be nice and light. <laughs> I promise I contain it to the beginning. Um, <laughs> but as we kind of talked about then, the slave trade ended in 1807, 1808, 1807 was when the bill was passed. 1808 was when it went into effect. Similarly, the uh, emancipation of slavery slaves happened in 1834. Mm -hmm. The bill was passed in 1833. However, when I was looking into this and I did not go too deep into this because um, I was already sad um, so this is just another date that I have is when I looked up when did slavery end in Jamaica specifically, it does say 1838. Mm-hmm. And so that to me, the reason that I'm kind of wondering about those dates is it feels similarly to here in the United States, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1861. But it wasn't until 1865 that all slaves were actually emancipated because a lot of slave owners just did not tell their slaves yeah. that they had been emancipated. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why we celebrate Juneteenth mm-hmm. um, is because that's the date in 1865 that all slaves were actually free yeah. um, or all enslaved people mm-hmm. were actually free. Yeah. And the I think that's probably so I think that's part of where like I was I was having trouble keeping track of the context of what was happening. Cause we're listening to it from this scared little girl's perspective. Right. And there's this window of time. It sounds like where the, they didn't have any more slaves anymore. Slaves were officially emancipated, but there was still violence. Yeah. And I think that's the window of time, which we're, we're seeing now, which just another interesting thing that I just checked as well is Jamaica gained its independence in 1962, which is the same decade that this book was published. Oh, interesting. Which I find really interesting. Wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There is, so especially in the section that deals with Antoinette's childhood, there's lots of discussion about the sort of, the way that their society is kind of caught up in this, um, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it like a race conflict, but there's just definitely this, this issue that's going on. So yes, they, Mm -hmm. they don't have slaves anymore, but there's still like a a lot of the side characters will make comment about being like, yeah, so like the plant slave plantations are gone, but these new people who came in afterwards, they're just as bad. And they're just kind of complaining about how like the system isn't better. There's still this whole like kind of societal like issue that's happening. And there's this big Mm -hmm. sort of conflict between people of color and the white people who have come in, um, like the white settlers essentially. And then which, because I think you can, at least the way that I would sort of lay it out, is that Rochester is, I would call him part of these, like, of like a white English foreigner coming in. He is not mm-hmm. part of um, Antoinette's group, sort of these, uh, like someone of the Creole um, community. And we discussed mm-hmm. in our Bertha episode that people of who are Creole, they can be, they can be both black, white, mixed race, all kinds of things. There's lots of comments made about Antoinette in this, that she Mm -hmm. is white, like in appearance. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know details more about different things culturally for her. But I think one thing that's so interesting and what is sort of central to a lot of her issues is that she finds herself in this kind of weird in-between. She's not Mm -hmm. a black woman and therefore she is scorned by fellow black women and like even like kids that she grows up with who are black, they kind of push her away. She isn't quite though of the like English like white people that are coming in like Rochester because she grew up mm-hmm. here on the island. She's part of this culture. And one thing I thought was so interesting. So in the audiobook version that I listened to, the woman who was doing the narration, um, you know, whenever she speaks for Bertha, she, or for Antoinette, she gives her the same kind of, um, kind of like Island Caribbean Jamaican sort of accent that she gives to the other characters. It's a, yeah. It feels a little bit more French mm-hmm. than some of the other characters, yeah. but it definitely, but not, not fully French. Like it is this like Creole accent, which that is actually one of the interesting pieces of context for this book as well is, sorry, I just hyper like three times before 
we started recording told me the pronunciation of the author's name. <laughs> and I just looked at her name and panicked. <laughs> Jean Rise. Rise. Yes. Nice. Like, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Jean Rise uh, was, so she, her mother was Creole mm -hmm. and had been in, her family had been in Jamaica for three generations. She was born in 1890. So long after this, but had direct family connections to it because her mother was from a estate that was a former plantation on the island. Okay. So this context that she's creating for Bertha is a context she has direct understanding of. And at the age of 16, she went to England and got an English education. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of some context that she's bringing in of this really clear understanding of England and learning English literature. And I just, I imagine a girl like that reading Jane Eyre and being like, I can tell Bertha's story. I know what this was like for Bertha. That's my family. Oh, that's, <laughs> right? that's so good to know. Like, I didn't look into any of this beforehand. So I love that. I'm super wondering yeah, about like, what kind of research did she do? Like, is this just like a white mm -hmm. woman, like assuming these things? So no, I love knowing that she has this background. Well, and, and it does like, I think it is one of those. So again, the beloved comparison comes back for me because I think that it is one of those, when we look at history from this strictly dates and facts, and here's the information, you lose the humanity of it. And you like, you hear something like, well, emancipation happened in um, 1834 in Jamaica. So that meant there was 2 million enslaved people on the island mm -hmm who were suddenly told that they were no longer enslaved. The slave owners were given a payout for the fact that their slaves are now being, are now freed. Mm -hmm. And you end up with complex situations like the one that Bertha's family was in where her dad sounds like a fucking monster. Like her, he was a slave owner. Her stepfather or her original Not father? Her original father. Okay. Mr. Mason was, just bizarre. Man. Yeah. Just, just kind of so a, dumb. a clueless, pompous idiot who's like, we're fine. Which, Nothing's going to happen. Yeah. And everyone's like, you idiots, um, they're going to kill us. But, <laughs> we're like her, like, and there had been a lot of slave rebellions, like you're, like you said, in Jamaica, like that was, that was something that is referenced in Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. So the fact that this man was a brutal, it sounds like slave owner, so brutal, in fact, that even though he was dead at the time the story takes place, people wouldn't work for his wife. Mm -hmm. And so they had this land that they owned, but they no one would accept their money to work on the land. Um, and they were really outcast from society, which reading it from the little girl's perspective, heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But when you take the step back, you kind of go, Ugh, I that's terrible for these people. Mm -hmm. But also... What? There's not a good other option. <laughs> well, I think you are touching on something that is so, I think, intriguing about Antoinetta's like tragic story is that mm -hmm. as our perspective character in this novel, she is a very tragic outcast person. And I think from the day she was born, she was kind of set up to be in this position mm -hmm. where unless you go someplace like very far away from here, at least in this place that you love and where you grew up and where you live you will never really be accepted. Everyone is going to either think that you are like the daughter of this evil guy, or they will think that you are this privileged, like white person who doesn't understand, or they'll be like a Rochester and come in and see you as uncivilized and like unequal and just all kinds of other horrible things. So one of my notes that I wrote down here, because I, we love making these kind of like mirror comparisons of Bertha mm -hmm. and Jane. And so I said here that, Antoinetta, like Jane, is a person who, from the beginning of her life and through the mm -hmm. end of her life, it was someone who just, I think, craved love and acceptance from other human beings. Mm -hmm. But because she is in this weird in-between spot, that is always denied mm -hmm. her. And like where yeah. Jane, at least, though she also has this more this unfortunate childhood and everything, she still like finds herself a white woman born in a white English culture where she has an opportunity to elevate her, her status and to have independence. And I don't think Bertha will ever, ever had that opportunity. And anytime mm -hmm. she did seem to have one glimmer of hope, someone would come and kind of squash it. And I think there's a lot to be said about 
people who envied her for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I, they talk a lot about her beauty and there's lots of things like when we see, you know, her going to the nunnery as a little girl and that interaction that she has with those other children where I think they mm -hmm. see her as like, oh, you're like this, like spoiled white girl or whatever, not knowing anything about the traumatic things that she's gone through. And so like they, they bully her and they put her down and all these other things. And so it's something where I feel like, yeah, happiness every now and then in her life is kind of dangled before her, but it's always snatched away. Well, and I think like, so where we start is these five years that they have pri like prior to her mother marrying Mr. Mason. What is this? Mr. Mason. Do they ever give him a first name? They probably do. It's but Dick's dad. Dick's dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she had, she had these two, this woman had these two children and was not really engaging with Bertha. So her son, Bertha's brother had some sort of developmental disability mm -hmm. and and so he was not well and required a lot of care and she also like just wasn't handling I mean like she was not equipped to manage what was happening mm -hmm. um and they didn't really have very many people around to take care of her so Bertha did sort of run wild like she just kind of did whatever and but had a great deal of fear and a very justified fear yeah because some brutal things happened to her in a way that is like heartbreaking to hear from a child's perspective how much they didn't understand what was going on. Absolutely. So, and then, so, and so that's where you start to see like those initial, what I really loved that I think she did really well is like, she doesn't make Bertha not crazy. Mm -hmm. And we see little hints of that in her nervousness and fear as a child mm -hmm. That uh, it can be seen as totally justified, but also is the way that mental health issues like anxiety appear yeah. as you get anxious about just being by the road and seeing people and you cannot move until someone comes and gets you when you're hiding behind a wall. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting and well done. Yeah, there was. So the thing about Bertha's fear that stands out to me that I thought was like the honestly I was like oh my god this is like kind of cute in a really sad way the story that she tells about how when she would go to bed at night she was really afraid that different things would come and get her and so she found it like a stick that had a nail in it and she would like curl up with that stick and a nail and like go to sleep so she's like I can fight the monsters or the bad guys or whoever comes to get me but um and I can't think of what her um like sort of her nanny sort of character is is it Christiana that sounds right yeah Christiana or something like that we should look it up but I think she came in and she's like no you're not allowed to have a nail with you and so she took the nail out of the piece of wood but she let her keep the wood so she's like I would sit there with my stick and pretend it still had a nail in it so I could fight away the monsters and I'm like oh my god and I literally said to Sam after I read that part I'm like I think our friend Maya would do this when she was little. Okay. So Christophine is the name of the, um, of her da. Yes. Which, uh, but absolutely and hilariously, this is a fun fact that Piper's learning right now. I also called Maya and also talked to her about that passage in the book. Oh my God. And she goes, Piper literally just told me this. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, we, we need him with love. Oh, no. We mean you're our favorite anxiety friend. She, you're nervous about safety. And she also confirmed this theory to me because she's like, oh yeah, there were times when I would grab a kitchen knife and then huddle up with my stuffies in my bedroom just in case. And I'm like, Maya, we love you so much. <laughs> She also has a knife on her usually. Yeah, so. you know, got to be safe. It's Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, what we're saying is if you meet our friend Maya, you leave her alone. Exactly. She can defend herself and we are also she, always there behind her to help she, her out. She will stab you and then we will punch the stab. <laughs> a thousand times. <laughs> um, but yes. So before we move kind of out of childhood era, I just want to say that it's so interesting to me. So I with how ingratiated we are with uh Jane Eyre lore I want to say mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there are certain kind of like tokens and boons that I'm always sort of like looking out for keywords that like sound of like mm -hmm. stand out to me on the page so anytime there's any kind of mention of fire or flame or anything like that with mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. popping out to me so yes the fact that she has experiences her home being burned down when this like kind of mob comes to attack her and her family. And some of the like just visceral little things that stand out to you in these moments of 
trauma mm-hmm. where she remembers that when her mother ran in to get her uh, brother out, she came and her hair was like singed. You could smell the, that her hair was burning. And there's this note later on when she goes to visit her mom and she has her hair in braids, but one braid is longer than the other because her hair burned off when she went into the fire. And then, of course, there's this image of what kind of actually stops the attack from happening is they had a pet parrot and the pet parrot caught fire and fell out of the house. And they were like, that is a bad omen. We should all leave. And so then everyone kind of gets out of there, but just to like experience these things at such a developmental stage of your life um, and to see such horrifying things at such a young age, no wonder fire is prominent throughout Bertha's life. I think they do such a good job with um, Dick's dad of having it be this parallel of this culture that I think it's like such a great metaphor of just in general, the absolute fuck up (laughs) and horrendous crime that colonization was (laughs) of like this incredibly stupid British man who like just keeps dismissing. It's this house full of women who are from there and understand what's happening and have real justified fears. Mm -hmm. And he keeps being like, women and your crazy notions. (laughs) Obviously nobody's going to get mad at me. These black people are just cute. Boop, boop, boop. (laughs) Except he says way more racist than me. (laughs) Like so much more racist than what I just said. And what I just said was racist. (laughs) And he's just like so dumb and so arrogant and so sure that a white British man is the pinnacle of what a human being can be, that he's shocked when they burn down the house. Yeah. Floored. Yeah. Flabbergasted this man. <laughs> yeah. No, it's crazy. And it's so interesting to see. She writes this so well, every scenario, because I, I read it and I'm like, I can picture all of this clearly. Mm-hmm. But like, even when he's like ushering his family and some of the servants like into the carriage to get them out, this man who, which I think there's huge parallels between. Um, her stepfather in this situation, and then Rochester later in the story, a man who has zero control over the situation, Mm -hmm. desperately grasping at anything that he can control to still be like, no, 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 Uh, society told me that I'm an important, powerful guy. And so I'm an important, powerful guy, everybody. Stop burning my stuff, please. (laughs) Stop chasing me and my family, please. Thank you. Yeah, he just like keeps believing it's going to be fine. Yeah. Like there's this thing, that we learned about actually in a business management class, but I think about a lot in terms of life, which is there's two, there's a bunch of different kinds of power, but two of the biggest ones are explicit and implicit. Mm -hmm. So Richard, Richard's dad, Dick's, Dick's dad, Dick's dad, um, (laughs) Mr. Mason has explicit power and he's used to being in a society in a place where that matters, Mm -hmm. his money and his status and all of those things are supposed to be important. And he's gone somewhere where he's supposed to continue to have that. And he believes, as a white man, he believes that he is better than all of the people on this island. Mm -hmm. He believes that British society is the pinnacle of human life. So if he's at at high in that, then he should be high everywhere and everybody should just listen to him all the time. Mm -hmm. And then there's the actual power (laughs) that all of these people with, like, rocks and fire yeah have yeah over him mm-hmm. and power in numbers and yeah all kinds mm-hmm. of other things so and actually like if somebody just dropped that man in the middle of this like woods there he would die the woods i think it's more of a, just a like, jungle jungle situation <laughs> the woods <laughs> i also would die <laughs> um side note i have started following a few instagram accounts that are all about like how to survive in the wilderness because i've often thought to myself i'm like if i got lost in the woods i would not make it more than a day or two i can't make fire how do it teach me to make fire please internet and as much as we'd like to think that if sam was there it would be better the odds that he as a joke throws a hatchet in the air and kills himself before you make it out of the woods is high yeah because he's like you know what i'm going to add to this uh traumatic experience i'm gonna just accidentally off myself to give you some extra trauma. he thinks it's really funny every time we're at your house <laughs> and there's a fire to have a couple beers and then start throwing a hatch around and i don't enjoy yeah, it yeah neither do i and i live with him so <laughs> you're marrying him i'm just friends i know with him. <laughs> anyway we will not be going to jamaica on our honeymoon <laughs> to avoid this situation <laughs> 
because the only place that could happen would be Jamaica. Of anyway. Um, oh. But I, I do, one of the things that I want to touch on with the parallels between Mr. Mason and Rochester, because I think that's such a great comparison, because it really lays this foundation for us as to, it's part of the reason why you can just jump right into his perspective, mm-hmm. is we've had so much of Antoinetta's perspective, and we've had so much of her um, sort of an initially seeing all of these things and then seeing Mr. Mason come in and kind of like, again, from that child perspective of being like, you know, he was nice and he had money, um, but he was sort of fucking stupid. Yeah. Like he was really dumb <laughs> and got us into a bunch of trouble. Um, I think that's a really great parallel. And then the other great parallel is the relationship that Bertha's mother mm-hmm. had with Mr. Mason. Yeah. In that she originally came in, saw him as a savior, saw him as this person who was going to be able to give her and her children the security and life they need. Mm -hmm. And instead, he created so many problems that it resulted in um, a dangerous situation where Bertha's brother died. Mm -hmm. And then he was so condescending to her while they were leaving of being like, you need to just calm down. The boy might die. The bird is dead. Just be calm. Because uh, Antoinette gets hit in the head with a rock and is sick for weeks mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. And in that time, Bertha's mother is taken away or Antoinette's mother is taken away mm-hmm. because she is acting mad. The most traumatic thing ever happens to you. Mm-hmm. I'd also try to kill him. Yeah. Well, it's like, because we have, Antoinette is talking with her aunt, Clara, I believe is her aunt's mm-hmm. name. Uh, Cora. 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 Thank you. We're just going to make up extra names, guys. <laughs> That's fine. Um, she does a thing, which I feel like you, and I'm not, I don't mean to project this about you. It's just, you know more about <laughs> childhood like stuff and when it comes to like therapy things. But she does this thing where it's like the child kind of almost tries to protect the adult from what the kid knows by pretending that they didn't overhear mm-hmm. all the fighting and the screaming and all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. And she's like, nope, I'm just going to let you keep on believing that I'm an innocent kid who slept through that whole but like situation. But nope, she hears mm-hmm. it all. She knows what her mom was going through. And yeah, so like ugh, all this stuff that we get from from those scenes. Well, and then there is an implication later that genuinely like I think there's a brutality that all of the men have mm-hmm. against the women here, which is like also it's the same thing we talked about in our Bertha episode where it's like it's not wrong. Like it's fiction, but it's also not wrong. Yeah. Like this is indicative of how men treated women. So she was supposed to be mad and there's an implication that her the man who was supposed to be the couple that was supposed to be taking care of her, the man was sexually abusing her yes. mm-hmm. until she died. Yeah. Um, and using the fact that, she, which is something that happened and pro- and still happens a lot mm-hmm. to people who are supposed to be cared for by people. And it just, it makes, and, and one of the things that we'll, we can talk about more in the end of this is like, this does not change canonically Jane Eyre. Mm-hmm. But there's so many questions left in Jane Eyre. This is one of the possibilities of what that reality could have been. Yes. Yeah. I think. And it's heartbreaking. (laughs) Agreed. No, totally. Um, That's, I think, where the people that I see that seem to be very, like, pissed about this book. I mean, this isn't written by Bronte. So this is literally someone's, like, interpretation. You could call this fan fiction. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to take this at face value and say, oh, this is absolutely what happened. This is just one person, yes, putting forward, being like, hey, based on stuff that were happening to other people in similar situations at this time, here's one possible way that you could look at um, Bertha's past. So yes, take it well, as think, you want. I think this is an example of why it bothered me so much and still bothers me when there's this really simple answer that is often given mm-hmm. for Bertha being crazy. And so it's, oh, everything Rochester did was a hundred percent justified because Bertha's crazy is the madness going back three generations. And it's like, and we'll talk about this when we talk about part later parts in the book, but like, this is a traumatic situation. Like this is a traumatic, we could interpret Bertha in a lot of different ways. Living on this Island during this time, anybody has some level of trauma and the there is something super dismissive about that that we do to people in general with mental health issues, mm-hmm. but women to an extreme yeah. of reacting to a situation 
that is traumatic Mm -hmm. as if it's traumatic. And instead of being like, that's terrible and awful. And you can scream about that if that's what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'll help you kill Dick's dad and it's going to be fine. <laughs> there is literally a line in this story and because I, I was listening to it, I, w- I didn't have a chance to kind of like underline it and write it down. Um, but there's a line that Rochester says, and it's something kind of I'm paraphrasing to the extreme, but there's something along the lines where he's literally being like, he's like, like, don't feel your emotions, just like push them down and you won't be sad anymore. Don't think about those sad things. And she's like, fuck you, dude. You literally sat me down here in the dining room to be like, what's wrong? Let's figure figure it out. Now I'm going to tell you my backstory. And you're like, actually, if it's going to be all like emotional and stuff, I don't want to hear it. She's like, "Mm -mm, you're hearing everything. So get ready. It's something that he says a lot because it's one of the first criticisms he has about people on the island in general. Mm -hmm. And he does explicitly claim that the black people are the ones who are doing this the most, where it's like, they're just so uncivilized. And his example of uncivilized is like, They just feel their feelings so loudly at everyone all the time. And he's like, I learned how to stop doing that. And I'm like, maybe you're the one who's wrong. Yes, you have this horrible emotional repression. Not healthy, dude. Yeah, it's very bad. Um, I think you said, Lillian, in a recent episode, and I can't remember the exact context, but you gave um, all British people the permission to feel their feelings. And I think mm, yeah. Rochester Same. really needed to hear that. So <laughs> yeah. too bad he didn't. <laughs> it, they're spooky. Listen, don't get me wrong. They're spooky. I'm going to tell you guys a quick little fact that I hope won't bum you out. But like, as it turns out, I have been doing a repress of my feelings. And over the last three years, since that one tiny little mentee bee, I've been working very hard with therapists to feel them again. It's not an easy ride, Mm-mm. but there it turns out pretty important because people in the Midwest, we also do it. We also go, feelings, what are those? Nah, nah, everything's fine all the time. Just smile and say, oh yeah, sure, you betcha, and it'll be okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Just eat some casserole. It's going to be just fine. Just have a hot dish. It's going to be great. Everyone feel your feelings. Uh, your feelings are real. <laughs> feel them. I was like, hot dish, as it turns out, we've tried it, does not cure depression. You do have to feel those feelings. Nope, you got to feel them, you got to experience them, and uh, it's all going to be okay. But And I think that's one of the great things about this book, too, is that we get that lesson mm-hmm. by listening to Rochester do it wrong. Yes. Yeah. Of like, what he's suggesting is definitely not right. <laughs> so. Right. So second chunk of the book, we jump into they've been married. There's a brief kind of like part where he sort of reflects on the fact that right before the marriage, Antoinetta almost didn't have it happen. She was kind of like, I don't want to do this. Actually, sounds like it might kind of suck thinking about what happened with my mom and that guy that she married. I heard you laugh and it sounded spooky to me. So I don't want to do it. Yeah, you have a creepy laugh. So maybe this is actually a sign that I shouldn't marry you. Guy I just met who also has been violently ill the entire time that I've known you. (laughs) Can you imagine? And is currently (laughs) dealing with a fever. Can you imagine they like wheel this guy off the boat? He's like, like barfing and he's all gross and pale and clammy and you're like this is your husband also he really doesn't like anybody who lives here but he's gonna marry you i guess doesn't that sound fun it's like no richard's like my dad died recently while he was on the well this man was on the boat my dad died and that bastard gave you half his money and i don't want to manage that shit for you and i don't know you what you would do with it if we just gave it to you so i found a white man to take care of you for me so i don't have to worry about it in exchange for all your money <laughs> so they do end you up getting dick. married um i'm glad she bit him later yeah seriously and stabbed him <laughs> do a good bite and stab well done antonetta <laughs> I think the the part that I just personally enjoyed the most was this whole kind of trip that they take up the mountain to go to their honeymoon spot. And it's just so interesting to see how she can describe such like raw, natural beauty, things that we today, at least in our cold Midwestern setting, sort of romanticize. It's not always cold here. It's winter. Well, I'm just saying (laughs) right now it is, it's cold winter time. Everything is icy and you have to slip and fall and hurt your back constantly. So the idea of going to a place where there is clear mountain water trickling down the edge of this road that you can just grab a leaf, collect it and have a fresh drink. And all around you is big blue sky, huge, gorgeous, just clouds, just flora and fauna that is like beyond anything that we've seen in the last six months, which is kind of how I feel like that is that cold setting is what 
Edward Rochester has come from. And now he's put into this Mm -hmm. beautiful, gorgeous place. And I think partially because he's been really ill. And it's no fun to be sick, as my dad always says. (laughs) It's no fun to be sick. So he's violently ill. He's also a foreigner in a strange lead where he doesn't understand the custom. I feel like he there to give him some credence he also is somewhat thrust into the situation as we see through the letters that he writes to his father and all this stuff he feels very like oh this is my last like effort chance to just get my family off my back i'm forced to do this i don't know this person she's a stranger but so like to be in such a beautiful place and yet he is so angry and upset and it's just really interesting to see that balance well and i think she does a good job like this is one of the other things i was talking about where it's like I was anticipating not having any sympathy for Rochester in this book Mm -hmm. because that's the way people talk about it. Like the way that people talk about this book, they're like, they make Rochester a monster. And I'm like, she makes him a human monster. Yeah. She makes him so human Mm -hmm. because you've got to like you picture this 22 year old like he's supposed to be like 22, right? Yeah. He's pretty young. He's he shows up and he's doesn't have a good relationship with his dad and his brother. Mm -hmm. He's being told this is the only thing that he can do in his life is go to this place. Um, He's not told that he's going to be marrying someone until he's there. Mm -hmm. The person that he like knew about is dead when he arrives. Mm -hmm. He's so sick and he's still not better. And he's essentially told like he doesn't have if he doesn't marry Bertha. What else is like going to happen? Yeah. Right. Like he doesn't know. He's just doing what he's told. Mm -hmm. This same kid who was raised to believe that you're not supposed to feel your feelings and you're just supposed to like do what you need to do. And like you just put you just keep calm and carry on, boys and girls. (laughs) Like that's that's what he thinks is the right thing to do. So like even in the moments when he's actively lying to Antoinetta to get her to marry him, Mm -hmm. you still are like. You're so young yeah. and so dumb yeah. and so sick. Yeah. <laughs> you have not thought about the consequences of this happening. And he doesn't know her at all. Like the it's what he he continues to do. Like he's so this is the thing about like the parallel between him and Dick's dad is Dick's malicious. Rochester's dumb. Rochester is pretty dumb in this situation. Which is the opposite of what we feel in the book usually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The whole time we've been talking about like him, I just keep thinking I'm like, oh, he's like tummy ache Rochester. <laughs> he has tummy issues. He has the, he has the man flu. Oh, poor baby. <laughs> but I think the other thing that I love about this section is this is like the one part where I think we see uh, Antoinetta just being allowed to be happy for a brief moment. Mm -hmm. She is in her element here. She knows this place. They're going to her favorite spot. And so I think this is where she is probably the most beautiful and curious to him when she's guiding Mm -hmm. him up this mountain and knowing everything. Like he's like, what is this? What's that? And she knows all these plants and all these animals and she knows the location and the people here. And then they get to this little spot, which through his description is made to sound run down. But I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, everything about this, if we saw it nowadays, we'd be like, oh, this is gorgeous. Look at this house up in the mountains. Yeah, if we showed up to a vi- our tropical vacation and somebody said to me, so you just walk down that little path right over there and then there's going to be two different pools. One is just like kind of chill and then the other one has a little bit of a waterfall. But don't worry, it's very little. It feels really nice on your back. I would be like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me because my dad and my brother are fucking dead. <laughs> so I'm going to stay here forever and make sure that you're happy because you're the one who knows. Like, that's the thing that I felt like shaking Rochester in this mm-hmm. is he couldn't let go of his idea of what should be. Yeah. Instead of just being happy mm-hmm. here with these people yeah. and accepting that this was paradise and like all of these things, he kept getting so focused on how he should be what a British, uh, because it's that idea again of British men, Mm -hmm. British white man, peak of society, peak of a human being. So what I'm trying, I should try to force that to happen here. But that's not how things work. Yeah. And it's like something as simple as what time he wants to get up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like they're like, you should get up really early because that's the nice part of the day. And then you go to bed kind of early because it's really hot. Mm -hmm. And he's like, this isn't how we do it when I come from. <laughs> An afternoon nap? It's like, what are you? I never. Why won't that cock stop crowing? And they're like, it's a bird. It's what it does. Chill out. That that moss was fucking huge. And she's like, just throw it over the balcony. It's fine. 
the other uh, key word that kept popping out to me, because when he's in the garden before he proposes to Jane in Jane Eyre, he sees a moth and he talks about how it reminds him of these exotic moths that he saw back here. And so here we see these moths, but where it's so interesting that in Jane Eyre, he has kind of like a romantic lens about it then, I think because he's in a comfortable, familiar English setting and he's about to propose to the girl he's been gaslighting. <laughs> So he's feeling like he's on top of the world. But like in the setting where he originally saw these actual like giant, beautiful creatures, he is in this setting that though beautiful, he feels it's very plain that he is the outsider. And here they're kind of more like monstrous freaks that fly into the flames and die and then cover his table with dead bugs. And he's like, this is horrible. I hate this place. Well, and I think that that's the other thing that's sort of interesting as well is like there's this almost because he does he switches the way he describes it because mm-hmm. he starts by he calls it paradise a lot yeah so it's like there's something in him that could want this yeah that could want to be here mm-hmm. but he just is so uncomfortable with it yeah. because of the way that people talk about things because of all of these things that like he doesn't understand mm-hmm. which like i get that yeah I, again, want to shake him and be like, you have to push through that feeling Mm -hmm. and learn and then get comfortable. Yeah. But like, and it's the, it's the reason too, like that she loves this, this almost isolation Mm -hmm. of this little paradise that they're tucked away in because we see his ignorance again when he starts to get these letters Mm -hmm. um, describing her history and he just like, He doesn't 100% believe it immediately, but because he doesn't see the nuances and complexities of the situation, because of his really deep-seated racism, which, by the way, there's no way that he would, that Rochester would be anything but this. Like, this is almost a generous view of the kind of racism that Rochester obviously has. Yes. Because that was how society was. I'm so sorry. That's the racism bell going off, people. (laughs) It's being like, guys, Lily, you can't go on another racism rant. It's too many. Your podcast is about Jane Eyre. Calm down. Never. (laughs) Um, But um, he doesn't see these people as people. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't try to, he doesn't believe that they have as complex of reasoning and emotions as he does. And so he doesn't go, this is a complex situation because slavery just ended. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of societal things that I have to be careful about because there's a lot of complexity here. Instead, he goes, whiteness and money are what's important. And so people are going to respect me because of whiteness and money. Mm -hmm. And any idea that conflicts with that, he just cannot understand. Yeah. I think one situation that Jean wrote that I thought was a beautiful way to kind of show his misunderstanding of things is when they're, they've been in the house for a while and he is talking with Antoinetta about the way that uh, Christophine dresses herself. And to him, he thinks, oh, she's too showy, gaudy, and also her outfit doesn't make sense for the work that she's doing. She should remember her place, etc. But then Antoinetta comes right back and says, no, you don't understand. Like she dre- she lets her dress drag on the floor to show that she is wealthy enough to buy multiple dresses. And it's a way to show that, you know, this doesn't matter to me. Also, she's not lazy. She takes her time because she knows how to manage her time well. And she doesn't have to rush through every task. She knows that if she goes through it calmly, she can take care of everything when it needs to be taken care of. And it's just beautiful yeah, kind of, exact, of... Yeah, way. One of the exact lines that she says in that moment is that um, every move she makes is the right move so she can do it slowly. Yes. No, it's a beautiful scene. It's great. And I love a way of showing here's how two people see this woman who, that lives and works in the house that they have. Christophine seems like such a, a interesting character. I would love to see how she would be portrayed on screen. Well, and I think that's that's I think a such like you said it's like this is one of those books that if you read it without a critical lens on it seems like a really simple story but then you read moments like that and it's absolutely not about just this moment with this person mm-hmm. it's about his inability to because he doesn't learn anything yeah. from that conversation yeah. he just thinks they're both wrong yeah like he just thinks that Antonetta is also wrong now mm-hmm. So one thing that I want to touch on before we kind of move on to another topic is 
So because you mentioned that he does mention, he does refer to this place as paradise a few times. And if Mm -hmm. we were almost to like slip into a hypothetical of what if he wasn't a man with a tummy ache and a lot of racism and he was open to learning new things, (laughs) could they be happy in this place? Because there's an interesting, another situation similar to how they talk about Christophina is the way that they talk about this landscape. Because even though this Mm -hmm. is a beautiful place where uh, Antoinetta is, I think, happiest. She romanticizes a faraway land. She thinks that uh, London must be that magical fantasy place. And he's like, "What? No, London is cold and crowded, and a big city is gross. This is this is where it's at." And she doesn't well, want that. She wants he, something else. So, and it's so interesting the way they both talk about it because you're right in that they both like it's this idea of. She refers to England as a dream. Yes. A friend of hers wrote her a letter Mm -hmm. and said that England is like a dream. And he says, this place is like a dream. Mm -hmm. That place is real. And it's this idea of like the different contexts that they're coming from. Mm -hmm. They can't, they don't, and and neither of them, I think Antonio is more capable of it and I think would do it. Yeah. um, Where he's incapable of seeing that other perspective like he again in that that example again instead of being like it's so interesting that we have these different experiences and these different perspectives he goes you're so dumb like you're dumb and wrong (laughs) cities are real and this is a dream and you suck um so i think if he wasn't if i think if somebody who was more open-minded didn't suck Mm -hmm. was there with antoinette i think the other really critical thing. And Christophine actually says this, which I think is so interesting. And I will talk about it more in depth, or maybe we can talk about it now. She says, you either had to be a lot better or a lot worse Mm -hmm. because of where, where Antoinette is at with her mental health. Yeah. Because I think there's these underlying currents that are making him uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. but if he was able to actually find more comfort with Antoinette, I think he might've been able to get past that. Yeah. But he doesn't understand her trauma that she's been through. And she tries to bond with him and tries to talk to him for the first time ever. This is the first time she opens up to anyone. Mm -hmm. She opens up to him and says things that are disturbing. Yeah. But it's because, but we know it's because of these disturbing things that have happened. Mm -hmm. And we know it's because of this trauma that she's going through. But if you, if you add the layer in of you are really ignorant you're rochester you're very ignorant you have a tummy ache you're in a foreign you have a tummy you're grumpy ache. about being in a place that's we not home <laughs> can't forget about the tummy ache. <laughs> and you have this one thing to hold on to which is your hot rich wife mm-hmm. um and then and in the night she keeps after you guys have sex being like if you told me to die so i could die happy i'd do it right now you just tell me and i'll die mm-hmm. And like, that's a little game that she plays and he doesn't understand that idea at all. Yeah. And so he, and his, again, like you go back to what does he think the right thing to do is the right thing is to control, be more British, mm-hmm. get her away from this hot climb. It's probably making her fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When do you think the turning point happens? Cause it feels like there is for a little bit, somewhat of a quote unquote honeymoon phase where mm-hmm. he's like, he's going for it. They're banging. He's like, this is all right. Like it's weird. I have a tummy ache and I'm grumpy and racist, but it's not the but worst. I like my little pool that I can go sit yeah. in. Yeah. Got cool water. Yeah. I just get to have sex with my hot wife at night. And then I go sit in a pool all day. It's great. It's great. You know? And then he has this kind of turn. And do you think it happens like when he gets that first letter? Cause it comes from, another half brother of hers or so the person claims yeah that's not an 100 percent confirmed but mm, i think right. there's this layer of i think it's he feels off like he's off a step mm-hmm. like he's felt that way the whole time that he's there and as he's getting his feet under him he's still being thrown off by bertha talking about this stuff yeah and if it's if he had had anyone good and sane to talk to mm-hmm. If anyone, if he'd had any level of support system with anyone that he trusted and could actually talk to, and if he wasn't such an arrogant asshole and could talk to any of the people who actually knew her, Mm -hmm. I think that that could have been better. Yeah. But it's that he has this seed of doubt. He has this kernel of discomfort. Mm -hmm. He's just so uncomfortable by her being crazy a little bit, being traumatized. Mm -hmm. 
that when somebody goes, she's fucking nuts. He's like, I knew it. Her mom, her <laughs> mom is nuts and they lied to you for money. And I feel sorry for you mm-hmm. because your wife's so goddamn crazy. And I think it's just now he can't trust the one person he was starting to trust. Yeah. And he can't build it on their relationship anymore. I also feel that in the context of this story, like from the start, I think he was looking for an excuse. Like he was Mm -hmm. looking for an out. And when that letter comes, he's like, this is it. Sweet. Awesome. It's not that I am racist and have a tummy ache. It's it's that she's crazy. And this person confirms it. I'm not the problem. You are. Exactly. So I think he was just waiting for something and that letter was it. Mm -hmm. So he goes and he talks to this potential um, other uh, half brother of Antoinetta's learns all these information all this information that he tells her things that we also get from the story that she comes from a a long line of crazy ladies and all this other stuff and i think it's so interesting that the way this is written is that i don't think it's delivered as 100 percent certain fact everything that this guy tells him because many people say Mm -hmm. they're like that guy is a liar and he'll do anything for money he hates white people and he likes tricking them and blah 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 and all this other stuff and so who knows if the things that he says are true Um, We obviously get like our own glimpses of her trauma and the way that her mother deals with trauma. But then again, there's that whole question of how does anyone remain sane in these situations? Well, and I I also think there's this layer of like, you can take just enough truth Mm -hmm. and frame it in whatever way you want. Because like, there's the way to frame it like he frames it, Mm -hmm. which is Bertha's mad. Her mother was, you're starting to see that madness come out. It's going to come out more and more. Her mother was mad. We don't even know if she's dead or alive because they locked her away, which is why even when Antonio comes out with all these truths and starts to tell him the real story, he's like, that actually backs up this other guy's thing. Because the true, sto- the truest version of this story mm-hmm. is something incredibly traumatic happened to these women. And instead of getting support, mm-hmm. they got not that. Yeah. And she's looking for support from you. And he, instead of providing that, he does, that's the other thing too, is like, she does such a good job of making it clear that he thinks he's helping her. Yeah. Like he, what he's doing, he thinks is what's best for her. Cause there's that heartbreaking passage where she's really losing her mind. And he's like, I'm going to take care of you. You just have to reach out to me. If you reach out to me, I'll take care of you. And she's reached out to him too many times mm-hmm. and so she won't do it anymore. Yeah. No, it is really interesting to see how that, progresses because yes there is that Mm -hmm. while when she seems almost kind of desperate to please him and when she's talking with christophine i think she kind of at some point starts to fall back on her beauty and her sexuality and she's like well he doesn't respect me but maybe he still wants me right i'm still desirable and that Mm -hmm. part like breaks my heart i'm like no you're a human being and you need respect don't just try to appease him for like a little shred of appreciation no please don't do that but you know she's in this situation um and we also i feel like so apart from the letter and him looking for an excuse i love that we see his jealousy because it's something Mm -hmm. that he talks about canonically in the novel you know he's like you don't know what jealousy is because you've never been in love and i love that it's brought up here too when there's a moment when she's ill and this guy comes to visit her. And I don't think it's her childhood sweetheart that they's brought up many times. I think this is just like a guy, Mm -hmm. but she spends some time with him and, uh, Rochester's jealousy like rears up into full force. And he's like, Nope, like you're a slut. You were like flirting with that guy. Speaking of sluts, I'm going to go bang this maid and make sure that you can hear us doing it. And it's just like, Oh God, this is where he becomes a monster. Oh, like that is a, that is a moment where I'm like, you, like you, suck. Yeah. <laughs> he like knew he like, didn't, he had, he fully thought she was like beneath him mm-hmm. because she was black. Mm-hmm. He knew there was like a, cur- like a curtain or something so that was all that separated their rooms. He admits later he did it because Bertha could, or Antoine could hear mm-hmm. him. And he, like, does it anyway. And then he's like, she, like, really lost her mind about it. And it's like, you were the only thread of sanity this woman was holding on to. And she told you that over and over again. And then you rubbed your infidelity in her face because she talked to another man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm fine. It's at this point where I feel like he becomes so spiteful. And it's his Mm -hmm. actions are, like, venomous. And it's just, it's, Mm -hmm. it's 
a weird level of cruelty. So he he does he he cheats on her and he makes sure that she is aware of it. I think it also is infuriating the way I wrote this down as he's almost kind of gatekeeping her identity and her humanity from yes. her because yes. this is where Bertha comes from when he starts to call her Bertha and she's like crying and freaking out. And she's like, why are you calling me that? That's not my name. I'm Antoinetta. And he's like, I like the name Bertha. I want to call you Bertha. He's taking her identity away from her. And then later too, he starts to refer to her as Marionetta. And it's Christophina who says, isn't that like a doll? You think that she's a doll that you can manipulate? It's just creepy. This shit that he does at this part. I'm like, oh, God. And it's so interesting because we do sort of switch back and forth between his perspective and Antoinette's perspective in this section. It's interesting. I think her name, like to back all the way up, she starts as Antoinette Causeway, which is not a name that we had heard Mm -hmm. previously at all. Yeah. So then when Mason comes around... He gifts her his last name. Mm -hmm. He thinks this is something that he's giving her to give her power and status and money and to, to like, he's, he's adopting her, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's, but he's, he's stripping away a little bit of her identity Mm -hmm. and everybody on the Island still knows who she is. So it doesn't actually give her any safety of distance from the Causeway name. Mm -hmm. Um, But it does strip away a piece of who she is. And then Rochester comes in and I think he sees it as the same thing. Yeah. Like he's like, I'm going to distance you from that mad woman. I'm going to give you this other name. I'm going to give you this more British identity. I'm going to make you more like me. And me is the pinnacle of everything. So I'm going to, as a gift to you, give you something else. And she says, no, that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, but I'm going to pretend it's who you are. And that's going to make it so that I can stand to be around you. And that's going to be the best gift that I can give you. Also, your favorite name is Bertha. Gross. No, no, <laughs> dude. <laughs> you're like, you're, you're married to somebody named Antoinetta, and you're going to go with Bertha. Yeah, it sounds like a burp. <laughs> Come on. Sorry to anybody named Bertha out there, but also that was a bold choice your parents named uh, me. Maybe his tummy ache, he tried to say a name, and he just went Bertha, and he's like, I guess that's I was on purpose. <laughs> he was too embarrassed. <laughs> he's like, that's that's what I'm going to call you, I guess. This is what, this is, I did this on purpose. I meant to say it. Like everything else I do on purpose, I'm right. <laughs> Something else that I really want to talk about, because we have been going for a while, and I know there's more things we have to talk about, but the conversation that, so after he cheats on her, she runs away to Christophine. Mm-hmm. Christophine gives her some drugs for a little bit so she can just take a snooze <laughs> and stop being so hysterical. Um, and then brings her back to, or she comes back to him and she's like, looks just insane. Cause she's been asleep for three days. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has this really honest conversation with Christophine that I think is one of the most interesting parts of the book to me. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that she says, which is, this is the, this is the kernel of, this could all, this is the reason why this could be true given what we know out of Jane Eyre is he's like I'm going to take her to back to Spanish Town we'll talk to her brother we'll talk to some doctors like he's trying to get her help yeah. this is the best he knows how to do yeah. and Christophine comes back at him and goes if you do that she, she's not coming back from this mm-hmm. cuz those I know her and I I've helped take care of her her whole life and if you could just give her her money I could take care of her Um, and she could have a good life Mm -hmm. and I could find something else for her. If you take her back there, her brother's not going to want to deal with her. That's the whole fucking reason he married you off to her. Mm -hmm. And doctors will tell you whatever you want to hear and is, and also believe the doctors you're going to take her to are going to believe what you believe, Mm -hmm. which is that you are the pinnacle of society Mm -hmm. and that's going to kill her. And it will also be thrusting her back into this weird society where she is once again, her otherness is put on full display Mm -hmm. of being like, Oh, look at that white Creole woman. Who's not quite a black lady and not quite a white lady and all this other stuff. So not, not a good part of the oppressors, but also doesn't have any power left. Her poverty in, um, and her whiteness was unacceptable to this society. Yeah. So, are we, what other things do you want to talk about in this section before we take, we jump over to um, Jane there's Eyre plots? So, there's so many more things we could talk about, but I think we hit the big marks. Yeah. Really, really well done. Truly heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, because you see, you see her slip away. Yeah. You see her, like the heartbreak of him, of having what she thinks is happiness mm-hmm. taken away from her because she feels she's not good enough to get him to love her is 
terrible. I also think one of the cruelest things that he does too is that she begins so raw and vulnerable and she gladly like puts her happiness before him and he scorns it and he stomps on it and he says this is what you love that's sad and she's like what i thought this was the best and this is no good and it that's ugh, the whole and thing and he and his constantly sort of being like like her accusations the conversation in both times when he's in his head with um bertha's conversation where she's being really vulnerable and with christophine's Mm -hmm. we're in his head and we're listening to him be like i did do all of those bad things but instead of seeing that and accepting it he cannot get over his preconceived notions and so he moves forward with again what he thinks is best like he's a very human monster yeah in this like he's what he's i doing is like so brutal and so bad and also society failed him in in not in the same way Mm -hmm. but with the same flaws that ultimately failed her yeah um he's not set up for success that's that's for sure uh but we okay so we jump to thornfield and Mm -hmm. for me it was like kind of like a whoa grace pool mrs f and i was like i know who that is like it was these are my people (laughs) so it was kind of like a almost a little jarring and kind of exciting to like suddenly jump right into jane eyre which i thought was such an interesting choice the rest of this would make sense if you hadn't read jane eyre Mm -hmm. these last 11 pages you would have no idea what's happening yeah so we we're with Antoinetta and she sort of like wakes up almost from like a fugue state. And like, I think one of the first things that's addressed is Grace Poole being like, do you remember what you did last night? And she then, yeah, she's like, what, what are you talking about? I've got these weird like marks on my wrist, but I don't really know. Um, And she like recounts to her that her brother came and I love that. She's like, brother, which brother? And she's like, Dick Mason. And she's like, that son of a bitch. He ain't no brother of mine. And she's like, yeah, he came up here. We told him not to. You did not have it. Uh, and then he, isn't it, doesn't she say, it's like, it's only when he remarks that by, like, legally, he cannot interfere, like, because mm-hmm. of her marriage, that she then, like, lunges at him. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Grace Poole recounts all of this to her, letting her know uh, how she attacked him and all this stuff. And I loved how casually at least it seemed to me Antoinetta's like kind of thought process through all of this is just like this is my life and uh you know I wait for Grace to fall asleep I try some of her icky clear booze it's gross but I don't spit it out I grab her keys pretty easy I walk around the house I I avoid that ghost that everyone talks about (laughs) which I love is her so good it's so good that she's no one is more scared of the ghost at Thornfield than Antoinette. It's so good. And I thought it was so beautiful and tragic when she describes seeing the ghost in that gilded frame, the mirror. Mm. And I'm like, oh, you sweet baby. God, I just, I just want to hold her. Oh. Um, well, and I think another, they, it, it's another really great, because like she, we have this contextual snippet of like her overhearing Grace Poole talk to Leah. Yeah. And then she's like thinking about that later. She wakes up from this few state, like you're saying, and Grace is like, I don't think you forget as much as you say you do. (laughs) Um, And then she, we sort of hear the story almost backwards because she remembers, she's like, I remember stabbing someone. (laughs) And then I bit them. (laughs) Oh, he did say that to me, didn't he? And then she's like, I also don't, Grace was like, I don't know where you got that knife. I told him you stole it from me, but I never would have left a knife alone with you. I know you better than that. Where'd you get the knife? Who did you buy a knife from? She's like, she's like, yeah. You took me on my one, once a year field trip and I bought it from a lady when you weren't looking. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like, she answered is just sort of like, I don't know, you I I remember going to England and I felt a lot better in England. We're not in England now. And Grace was like, You dumb bitch. And it's like, <laughs> it's just is again so heartbreaking because you're like, you felt better when they let you go outside, honey. Mm-hmm. You're in and she keeps describing the house as made of cardboard yeah. in a way that is like so good like so well done yeah no i all these details in that last part were just amazing and i can totally see that in itself that section of the book is almost it's like standalone kind of little um uh short story but yeah yeah, no that was amazing and also so interesting that she essentially 
they the way it's written, Antoinetta essentially dreams burning the house down. She dreams everything that happens. So good. And then she wakes up, grabs a candle, and then goes out to do the deed that she just dreamt about. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting the way that it's written because I almost wonder, I don't think she, I don't, if I were to put on my little like interpretation cap, I don't think Jean actually thought that Bertha had a dream of everything that would happen and then went out and did it. I think it's more kind of interpreting how does someone who is this far gone in their brain see their actions and the way they interact with the world of, mm -hmm. you know, she does, I think everything that is in the dream, quote unquote, that is just her doing those things. And then to kind of comprehend her own death, it's sort of like this reawakening back in the room that she's imprisoned in. Grace is there and she has this access to this candle. And I just, oh, there's, there's a lot of in-depth analysis that could be done with that moment, but I just love the kind of the taste of it. Yeah, we could do like just this section, we could do like a whole really in-depth analysis on because I also think there's this interesting way of like, she has dreams frequently and she has this trauma of this fire and the reasons that people burned down her home mm -hmm. and how that felt for her and why she would want to do that back to Rochester. And she says multiple times in this with which, with her memory gaps, I think that this is probably like, about that. She keeps saying, if he, he's going to come visit me and when he does, I'm going to explain and then it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's how she's holding on to any thread of sanity, which is why she keeps just essentially blacking out and not remembering things is she keeps thinking if she can just talk to Rochester and explain, he'll let her go. Yeah. Cause she sees it as her being trapped. He's like, she's like, I just don't want to go. Like, just let me go. I'll just go out into England. Like, you don't even have to do anything. I'll just go. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Jesus Christ, that hurts me. I know. And so then there's this subconscious version of her that just wants to burn that place to the ground. And I loved when she was describing walking through the house and like setting things on fire. The one line about how at one point there's like this wall of flame and she's like, oh, it was there to protect me. I felt so safe, but it was too mm -hmm. hot to stand close to it. So I stepped back. But like the way mm -hmm. that she like fire is now her it's it is what will release her from this prison and so it is an ally yeah. and not something to be feared at this stage of her life well and she hears the voice yelling bertha mm -hmm. which we know is so triggering for her and we can also see as rochester and then she hears another voice over the edge yelling antonetta yeah and she is calling out for christophine the whole time oh it's mm -hmm. it's just gorgeous well done and Jean. it's so it's so well done and it makes me like this like my body is sad right now. yeah yeah <laughs> No, so if, um, if you don't like Rochester being portrayed as a monster and you don't like very depressing, sad things, I can see why this isn't your, your cup of tea, random audience listener, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a... I think it feels such important... I see why this book is always brought up to me yeah. when I mention Jane Eyre, mm -hmm. because I think it fills a gap of telling a story that matters like I do think like we we've talked about how sad this is maybe wait till winter's over <laughs> but I do think it's not long yeah it's a pretty short book um I mean don't don't we never encourage crimes but the audiobook is on YouTube mm -hmm. for free yeah two parts um and that really helped me because the writing and the Jamaican accent I had a really hard time with mm -hmm. and it was a lot easier to listen to yeah but yeah, it's it's really, really good. And I think it adds a perspective that I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And like we said before, like this is a version of what Bertha's life could have been like. Right. I also think that because because you said this came out in like the 60s, this book was published. Yeah, 66. So it's been part of the not necessarily the Jane Eyre canon, but it's been part of the Jane Eyre discussion and the Jane Eyre community mm -hmm. for so long that it's now, I think, a crucial thing to kind of have at least awareness of if you want to talk critically um, about different things. It makes me think, Lillian, about how you often say that certain adaptations seem to be like in conversation with the adaptations that came before mm -hmm. them. I think this book, whether you like it or not, I think it is part of that dialogue and needs to be mm -hmm. considered when talking about it. A hundred percent. I think that's, that's really, really true. We don't rate books, so we're not going to rate this. <laughs> I will say, um, I don't think I'd pick it up again, but I'm very glad that I read it. Uh, same. I, I also, if you haven't read Beloved, that was like a life-changing book for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible. It is like 
you need to go to therapy immediately afterwards, but it's so good. It's uh, yeah, um, beloved by Toni Morrison. Um, it takes it's about a a black family in the South after the events of the Civil War and just kind of how they deal and it with everything. and it moves back and forth. And one of there's one pa- there's a, so many passages that really break my heart, but there's one that isn't a spoiler. But the grandmother, so there's three generations living in this house. The grandmother, um, her son. Uh, saved enough money and bought her freedom. And she thought it was such a waste of money. Why wouldn't he do that for himself? Because she's an old lady and how is she going to appreciate that? And she said, the first free breath I took, I understood that he was right, that that, that mattered and there is a difference and it does matter. Um, and I think about that a lot. I'm impressed you remember that. Wow. It was true. Genuinely, this that was a life-changing book. And this book feels very similarly in that all of those all of those people feel like people now. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the really incredible things that literature can do. Yeah. And in the same way that Jane Eyre makes women people mm-hmm. yep, <laughs> um, and gives that inner life to women, I think this does that for women like, like Antoinette. Yeah. So this has been our kind of analysis and discussion of Wide Sargasso Sea. Uh, if you have opinions about it, which I'm sure you do if you listen to this podcast and have read this book, uh, we'd love to hear what you think. So you can reach out to us on social. We're at AirBuds. You can also send us a very in-depth uh, essay that you wrote when you were in IB English class reading this book. Yes. Um, you can give us... Or Beloved. Yeah. And what do you think about Beloved? Uh, if you've seen the movie, I know they adapted that into a film. Um, tell us about that too. So We're not going to watch that because as I mentioned, I'm still traumatized by it, but <laughs> you should. Um, we can, you can reach us airbuds at gmail.com. Next week, we have a really special episode. We are going to be talking about Victorian fashion Me. with Layla. Um, I'm genuinely, we've already recorded this. It was such a blast. You guys, we had so much fun. Um, we went through general fashion trends and kind of understanding the fashion of the time. And then we went through three of our main adaptions, the 83, the 2006 and the 2011, and talked about specifically the costuming of those adaptations. Super well done. Uh, Layla is uh, Victorian dot historian on Instagram. Mm-hmm. She is a friend of the show. You guys could, should go follow her. She's the best, such a blast to chat with her. Um, the next week, which I'm mentioning now, because I'm going to have you guys do a little survey about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are going to do a palate cleanser and we are doing a palate cleanser survey for my birthday because right now I'm 28, but by the time you guys hear this, I'm going to be 29. Yeah. That's how time works. Hooray! Um, so for my birthday, and we're going to do this for Piper's birthday for our next palate cleanser, Mm -hmm. I got to pick all four adaptions uh, or all four shows slash movies on our list. (laughs) So the first one, as I'm sure some of you would guess, is Bridgerton season two, because Piper has to watch it. (laughs) It's so, it's so in Piper's happy zone. And I think she'll like it more now that she knows what to expect going into a Bridgerton. (laughs) I mean, I knew what to expect the first time, (laughs) but. You didn't quite know what to expect. I think you were disappointed that it wasn't more more period drama. Well, I got that and was too modern for people. I got that vibe though. That's kind of why I didn't want to watch it in the first place. But this one, <laughs> this one I know has a brooding guy falling in love with a cute lady, and I'm all about that. So who knows? Anyway, Piper would only ever do this if you guys vote for you it, and it's it. my birthday. <laughs> yes. For birthday wishes and forced votes, I will do that. But so what are the other some- options? If for some reason you don't want to make me happy for my birthday, <laughs> um, you can also do Shakespeare in Love is the other one, Emma 2020, which you haven't seen that one, have I you? I have seen that one. Oh, okay. And then Notting Hill, which Piper also hasn't seen and is not a period drama. It's just a thing I like. Yeah, I'm excited to see that one. I hope that's kind of what I'm rooting for because it's got Julia Roberts, right? Yes. Yes, the, the woman who I based my identity off of as a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also, it is a movie that my mom and I have watched about 100,000 times. I do know all of the words to it. Very nice. So cool. very, very Lillian's birthday, if that's what you guys want to vote for. All of these would make me incredibly happy. I just know this is my one shot at getting Piper to watch Bird in season two. <laughs> Until um, Lillian so. um, con- comes up with another ploy to... T- put me into a corner, a Bridgerton corner. <laughs> well, you did sign that lifelong contract to do this podcast with me. So I've got next year at least. Mm, there we go. Uh, 
<laughs> next year, I'm just long like, until next year, until I kill myself to get out of it. <laughs> Piper's like, listen, you, I have two choices. I can kill me or you, and we don't know. I'm going to get through my wedding, and then we'll find out. You know what? I can um, also just break in and burn the contract. We've discussed this in the past. It is flammable. I could pull a Bertha. <laughs> you'd have to A, find it, and B, get it out of the flame fireproof face mm. let me try again but leave it all in <laughs> fireproof safe i have there we go any who's a woozle if you are like lillian what can we get you for your birthday well first of all um you can vote for the things on the poll um it's going to be on all of our social including youtube because i just learned how to do polls on youtube so you should go follow us there uh subscribe to our youtube channel uh for my birthday also I do accept cash gifts in the form of Patreon subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Please give me your money. (laughs) I would like that. You would like that. You like the show. You're still here. (laughs) This benefits all of us, uh, but it will especially be a special gift for Lillian on her birthday. I'd lose my damn mind if you guys joined. We're going to be... Just please join our Patreon. Three bucks. Fun. Three, You'd like three it. birthday bucks. <laughs> three birthday bucks. Come on, guys. Um, we'll stop begging now and, and trying to preserve the last shred of our dignity. Um, Piper will. I beg all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. And um, if we, you're still here, we love you so much. More than the rest. <laughs> we love you're in you. a secret club. So we'll see you next time. Until then, happy Jane Eyre reading and watching. Bye. Bye, guys.